The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope you all had a very nice break. I very much enjoyed the downtime, and I hope you did too. It involved a lot of staying away from my phone, which was a bit tough to begin with, if I'm honest, but very enjoyable. And I actually did manage to switch off for a good week, at least, I'd say. And I'm hoping to do much more of that this year. This is just a quick hello from me to wish you all a happy 2022. And coincidentally, there's just been some positive news coming from London, which is my hometown today. And that is that the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, is planning a limited cannabis trial in three of the 32 London boroughs. It's aimed at young people. So 18 to 24 year olds found with small amounts of cannabis will be provided with support services as an alternative to criminal sanctions. This is obviously a great initiative, keeping young people out of the criminal justice system for minor offences has got to be a better way to deal with things. It's very much a small trial. It's still in development, so more details to come. But it's a much more proactive and evidence-based way to deal with cannabis in young people. And let's hope that the, the government pays attention because... The noises it had been making last year were contrary to this type of policy. Glad to see VaultFast involved in this scheme. And I very much hope to get them on the show in the next couple of weeks to discuss this and general movements in drug policy. On the consultancy side, we at Canverse are always keen to help more people navigate the European cannabis industry. So please do get in touch if you need any commercial, strategic, legal or investment needs. Uh, We'd love to chat. Anyway, back to the show. It's the last one that I recorded when I was in Denmark in November, actually. So enjoy. On today's show, I have Peter Segeti. Peter is COO of Valcon Medical. Valcon are a contract manufacturing medical company focused on cannabis extracts and based in Denmark. Peter, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good to see you. It's great to actually be here in Denmark. This is my final episode of my little tour of Danish cannabis. <laughs> it's been a great few days and nice to round it out here. You've very kindly taken me for a little tour of the facility. It's quite exciting, right, to be in a nice new facility? It is, it is. It's been a long road to getting here, but now we're all set up and, and licensed and yeah, ready for the next steps. Yeah, very exciting, very exciting. We'll talk a bit more about Valcon in a minute, but maybe we'll talk a bit about you to begin with. Usual place to start, you know, a bit about your background, but also how and why you decided to get into the cannabis space. All right. So my background is I hold a Master of Science in Economics and Business Administration. I've worked a couple of years in finance and accounting, both in smaller companies and in a large shipping company. How did I get into to medical cannabis? So it's a, <laughs> it's a good question and it's a pretty much a matter of coincidence, actually. In 2018, the legal framework for medical cannabis became active in Denmark. And what we saw was that very swiftly a large flow of investment started coming into Denmark. And some of these large Canadian producers started uh, recognizing the opportunity to produce and manufacture in Europe. So they started establishing themselves in Denmark and it was all about the news. And it got my attention. And that's when I realized that it's really just a just a once in a lifetime opportunity that there is actually an established industry that all of a sudden is able to tap directly into without having to invent something entirely new. So we have a we have a methodology that's already existing from North America on how to produce it. And now you're able to do that in my home country. So I started looking at bit more into it. And uh, through network and coincidences, I met Pete Patterson and, uh, and Joel Sherlock, who were among the, uh, the founders of a Canadian extraction equipment company called Vitalis Extraction Technology. So they were actually in Europe to sell their equipment. And they were on a roadshow in Denmark and realized that 
most of the companies establishing themselves here were mainly focused on cultivation. In other words, no one wanted to buy the equipment. <laughs> so we decided together to establish a contract manufacturing organization in Denmark that could extract for these established companies. So that's how it all started. And in, in December 2018, we incorporated Belcon Medical. Fantastic. That's quite good that you're sort of tapping into the North American market. Was it quite a learning experience for them, I suppose, you know, coming over and, and sort of figuring out how different it is actually to North America? Yeah, so obviously the approach is very different here. The way that you produce and manufacture is the same, but the big word on everybody's mouth was GMP, EU GMP. And yes, it obviously took some time to take all of the knowledge that they had about extraction and putting that into a context of GMP. So yes, it, it was very different. Yeah, and I think it's something that people don't always appreciate. So there's a lot of learning there uh, for everyone, in, including people in the European space as well. And just, you know, before we get into talking about Valcom, on a personal level, when you started looking at this, did you encounter any stigma from family, friends, or anyone sort of say, are you mad? All this kind of stuff. <laughs> Actually, a lot in the beginning, because... You know, when you dive into it, you think that everybody knows that there's a law for medical cannabis in Denmark. But it turns out you're biased in that way that when you pay attention to it, you think everybody else knows. But, but there was a lot of stigma. Even just after incorporating the company, we had to set up a bank account. So I called one of the largest banks and asked them, hey, I'd like to set up an account for this new company. Okay, what do you do? Medical cannabis. The first thing they asked me, is it legal? <laughs> so yes, there was, but it quickly changed because the approach was so medical. Yeah. And that's also why for the professionals in the medical industry, it does not necessarily excite them that it is medical cannabis. For a lot of people working in the industry, it's just another medication that they have to be part of producing. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned in my time here has been just how well respected Denmark is on when it comes to pharmaceuticals and particularly standards. You know, it's up there with Germany in terms of setting the highest standards in Europe, which I think is really important. I think everything needs higher standards. So I guess you're tapping into that. Yeah, that's the thing is that I believe around 16 percent of all Danish export is actually pharmaceuticals. Well. Wow. And especially where Valcon Medical is located, is called a pharmaceutical cluster in Denmark. So the knowledge base and the experience that there is in the, in the workforce is just uh, incredible. And setting up this business, we did manage to tap right into that and get build a team and, and an organization that's highly experienced working with, with manufacturing of medications. Yeah, fantastic. So why don't we talk a bit more about Valcon? You know, give us the elevator pitch. Well, what do you guys do? So Belkin Medical is a contract manufacturing organization that's focused on extracts. So we are licensed by the Danish Medicines Agency. We are based in Northern Copenhagen and we offer three revenue streams at the moment. We have contract processing, which is for established cultivation companies that can come to us as a service and get their cannabis extracted, get it formulated into a finished product and then sell it under their own brand. We also have the white label, which is sourcing flour from cultivation companies, creating a finished product and selling that to uh, distributors to sell under their own brand. The third one is uh, bulk manufacturing. So manufacturing of the pure extracts that can then go into a, another downstream process for a company that's specialized in whatever that might be. So those are the three revenue streams that we have launched with. Brilliant. There's a few questions there. So is that last part, is that making APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients? So we are going to be doing that at a later point. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's a, so to speak, a full spectrum extract. We call it a herbal extract. So it's not an API because it's not 99% clean or pure THC. However, we can sell it in a bulk format. So... If there was a company that would like to make it into an API, that could be an opportunity. 
Yeah. And out of those three buckets, you know, which ones are, are growing quicker than the other, you know, and, and where do you see that kind of panning out longer term? Very difficult question to answer. No, it's actually a good question. Initially, we had the idea that once we came out with our service, the majority of our activity would be devoted to the Danish cultivation companies. We quickly realized, however, that it also takes time for the Danish cultivation companies to get up to a point where they are ready to take an oil in. And there is only a handful of them that's established by now with a license. So now we actually have the most focus on our white label product. And we have spent the past year developing our THC, our first white label product, which is a THC cannabis oil, 25 milligram per milliliter in a 30 milliliter bottle. And that one should be ready for the market at the end of Q1 2022. So that is actually our main focus now and and also where the immediate opportunity is to sell into other markets than the Danish one. Uh, Presumably Germany must be a priority? Germany is obviously a priority. I guess it is for for most companies. And we are fortunate already to have some very strong partnerships established in Germany with German distribution companies that are going to be selling our white label product under their own brand. And obviously, we're, we're also looking at the other jurisdictions where it's possible to sell this white label product. And that's really the benefit of having a business model where we get to work close with the local partners who already has the knowledge about the market, potentially also already selling other types of medications. So they already have a good insight into the healthcare system and a brand that's recognized on the shelf of the pharmacy. And that's why on on short and and I believe also on long term, the white label strategy is a very viable one. Yeah. Good to have two or three running in parallel, you know, portfolio approach, (laughs) which is good. Diversification. Yes. I mean, like, you know, obviously Germany is the really obvious one. Are there any other territories in Europe you're kind of maybe surprised you or the ones that you think are up and coming? Poland is actually an interesting one. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Uh, It seems as if they are starting to have a very clear structure in the healthcare system and legal framework for medical cannabis. So we we have contact to some organizations there and and we're looking into the opportunity. The UK, obviously, is also an an interesting one. France is opening up, Greece, Malta. There's so many opportunities. And the thing is just that the regulations are also so different. And that means it's not always clear what you can and cannot do. And that's why it really helps working with the local partners that we have to navigate that regulatory environment. Yeah. I mean, it's that lack of harmonization, for want of a better phrase, is quite problematic. But then I suppose there's some opportunity there as well. There is. The lack of, you know, that's really the thing about when you talk about the European medical cannabis industry. A lot of the conversation tends to treat Europe as a whole, whereas when you're deep into it, the difference between each European country and how they, how their regulations are formed around medical cannabis is so different. And it's very hard to navigate in from another country because whatever laws they have are might written in their local uh, language and the conversation with the regulatory environment is ongoing. So it is, it is truly hard to navigate and Europe is not, it's far from harmonization. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about it just before we started recording, but we're talking to clients in North America and helping them to understand just how diverse and how different it is. I suppose it's not a million miles away from the patchwork that they have in the US, given that everyone's legislating at a state level at the moment, not at a federal level. But I think culturally as well, there is quite a difference between North America and here in terms of the the standards and the tight regulation comparatively. It is. And even just the regulation around the distributing the product and selling it, but also, as you're saying, there's, there's a cultural difference as well. If we're looking at Germany, they have had a tradition for herbal medicine. So what we have also come to learn is that normal practicing doctors in Germany have, uh, they're welcoming medical cannabis much more than in very much contrast to Denmark, where the healthcare system and the doctors have a very conservative approach. And medical cannabis is primarily prescribed by dedicated pain clinics. The reimbursement schemes of different countries, the insurance, how that works. There is whether you're allowed to sell it in a finished packaged product format 
or whether there has to be magistral step before it reaches the patient. There are many differences from country to country. Yeah, it's mind-boggling, actually. <laughs> I did do these projects, and I'm like, whoa, I just... The more rocks I pick up, the more the stuff there is underneath it. it yeah, it never ends. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't. And so, you know, that's a great description of Valcon. Oh, just before we kind of move on from that, are you seeing territories outside Europe that are open to the products and services that you offer? Yes. I mean, we've had some encounters with Australian companies, as an example. They have, is my impression, a lot of their own activity already. So I'm, I'm not so sure what that would look like in long term. Mm. But obviously, it's incredibly exciting just to follow the development of this industry outside the EU. Yeah. I mean, you would hear news about uh, Thailand. I read an article about Pakistan recently. There's a lot of interesting things happening. And it's important to keep an eye on. Yeah, definitely. And maybe just to round it out a bit about Valcon, you know, how are you guys funded? Are you sort of private investment and stuff like that? How, how have you kind of found that journey? So we started by doing what most companies do when setting up small uh, friends and family round. We have been very fortunate to find some very strong partners from the beginning. So our primary investors are two funds, one of them being Artemis Growth Partners and Greenfield Global Opportunities Fund out of Vancouver. So very strong partners on the, on the funding side. I would say very patient and they believe in the project and they understand the business. Brilliant. That's great. Always nice to hear good stories. <laughs> I, hope, I hope they're listening out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. <laughs> well, look, today we're going to talk about something I think is really important for the medical cannabis industry and actually the global industry is this idea around vertical integration versus specialization, because I think it's a topic that's frequently talked about. So let's take, you know, I always like to keep it quite basic to begin with. What does vertical integration mean generally? So vertical integration means doing everything in-house, covering the entire value chain in-house. The opposite of that specialization is choosing one thing or only a number of things in that value chain that you specialize in. Great. That's <laughs> that was short. a nice and <laughs> easy explanation. Yeah. And in particular, how does this apply to the cannabis industry? So in Europe, if we look at it here, we can break up the value chain into pieces. So we can start with cultivation. We can even go further than that and say plant breeding or genetics. But let's just start with cultivation. You do the cultivation and after that, whether you want to release the flower directly to the market or you want to extract it, there is always a, a step on the analysis. So that is the analytical laboratory that does the COA, Certificate of Analysis. Mm -hmm. After that, we have what I like to call the downstream. So the extraction, the formulation. And then again, we have the analytical laboratory. And then as a last stop, we would have uh, distribution and sales. And that is sort of how we can break down the value chain and say, okay, are you covering only some of those activity or are you covering all of them? Yeah, that, I mean, that's great. And there are many different sort of steps in that chain. What are some of the pros and cons of vertical integration, do you think? So I would say an advantage of vertical integration is that you are keeping control over your supply chain and your value chain. So you keep things in-house, you conserve the knowledge, and you don't depend on other parties to deliver. There is also the, the advantage that if you manage to do everything to perfection, you also preserve all the margins inside your own business. A disadvantage of vertical integration can be that if you, I guess, attempt to span over too many activities and don't manage to perfect them, you would end up being maybe good at something and, and then not so great at, at something else. And all of a sudden, it can become a disadvantage because it would actually make more economical sense to just have someone else do it who's specialized. Obviously, we can also talk about the establishment cost and the time it takes and resources. And that's, I would say, it is also a disadvantage because it can reduce your focus on actually being perfectionizing the activities that you have. Yes. One of my favorite phrases is perfection is the enemy of progress. 
<laughs> you, know, you can become really obsessed with it. I guess it's that kind of jack of all trades, master of none type argument. And I think you bring up a very good point in terms of quite high capex, right, to to try and do all of these things. I suppose this an element as well, vertical integration can happen through acquisition over time, I suppose, if you... Yeah, I mean, if you see that there is a synergy and the popular phrase one plus one becomes three, then obviously it does not have to be uh, done by organic growth. You can merge, you can acquire. But then again, I would say there also always has to be a very good argument to do it because it can also a very big risk combined with doing it. As you can break down a culture that's working or you can impose systems that does not, it's not competitive with the new asset. But yeah, it's a possible way to go. Yeah. M&A is always tricky for that and many other, but yeah, getting two companies culturally to fit together is, is always a tall order, I think, but. That's a whole nother that's conversation. A, that's, a, that's a separate non-cannabis <laughs> yeah. conversation. Yeah. And so look, you're going to be very biased here, but what do you think the pros and cons of specialization are? Yes, I am going to be biased here. <laughs> so obviously, I would say if you specialize, you don't have control over all your activities. You will depend highly on suppliers and partners. And you would also be paying or reducing your margins because you have to pay that premium for the extra services that you have to buy. So in terms of advantages, I would say that the lower establishment cost can be it can provide better speed, speed to market. It also gives you flexibility to, to pivot it potentially. You get better efficiency and, and you're quicker to do the, the perfection and be really good at what you do. And you would also diversify your risk as in contrast to setting up vertical integration. So I would say there's arguments for both sides. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And so to drill it down, why do you think, I guess it's a test of your business case really, but you know, why do you think that specialization is particularly useful for the European medical market? So other than obviously the, some of the reasons that we've just been discussing, if we go back to one of the areas we talked about in the beginning, where we were saying that Europe cannot be treated as a whole when it comes to medical cannabis, each country has many differences. And if you are vertically integrated, or at least if you attempt to set up your own brand and your own distribution, you need the boots on the ground in each jurisdiction that you want to sell into. Whereas with our white label approach, as an example, we get to work with local companies, have lo local partners that has maybe been working in the business for, for several years or decades even, have a well-known brand, mm. knows their way around. And then they get to do what they're good at, which is selling the medication. Then we don't have to go out and establish entities in these countries, hire people, try to navigate all of this and starting up in each country. And I see that as a huge advantage for, for our business model is that we can get to work closely with local partners. Yeah. And I really like that because I always preach the spirit of collaboration as being kind of key to this. And I think, you know, everyone in Europe probably does need to come together a bit more to build this industry because it is it's still very early. <laughs> it is very early. One of the things is here in Denmark is that uh, we have a very strong, I would say, already a culture starting in the industry in medical cannabis where we have we collaborate across the companies, even direct competitors, having a trade union together, trying to impact the political work around the changing and amending the legislation to the industry advantage. And you have probably also recognized that while you've been here, that we are very open to each other and, and find ways of collaborating. And that is a big advantage. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was the symposium the other day was really great. It covered loads of different aspects, you know, from plant breeding and genetics to the actual dealing with patients and stuff. So it was really useful. I mean, you touched on it a bit in terms of regulations, but, you know, how do you think the regulatory landscape sort of lends itself to specialization? So right now, it, I mean, besides all the things we've already discussed about, about being specialized and having partnerships and collaborations to navigate the regulatory environment, there is an ongoing harmonization that is happening. We can't tell how fast that will go. That's still an unknown, but we are starting to see some 
tendencies as a, a common monograph for the flower and for the extract that will harmonize the, the manufacturing and the production and the standard of the product. So that's at least step one. Going forward, as it happens in, in many industries, I believe that there will be at some point some sort of consolidation. We have seen it in, in North America already. There was a big consolidation. I think we will see that in Europe as well, where companies merge together and work across borders yeah, as, as one business. Yeah, it does feel a bit like, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of companies doing the same thing. So, yeah, I think you might be right. And kind of let's maybe look to the future a bit now. You know, how do you see the market evolving and generally speaking? Generally speaking. Yeah. So at the moment, it's just important to get some product on the market. We have a lot of patients out there who's demanding a medical cannabis uh, treatment that cannot be supplied right now. So that is problem one, fixing that. Making sure that the patients in Europe have consistent access to consistent quality of products. We are hearing, we are experiencing right now in the industry that a patient can start on a product and then the treatment is working well after three months. There is a lack of supply on that product and they have to switch maybe to something else than medical cannabis. And that's not sustainable. So just getting a product out there right now, what needs to happen? After that, also as it becomes more recognized, as more patients are gaining good experiences and there is more data, there is more knowledge about it, creating more sophisticated downstream products is in my belief going to be happening. So in the, in the beginning, it will be more about the delivery methods, could be gel capsules or other types of, of delivery methods that's not so common at the moment. And expanding on that, going even further, what we're already starting to seeing is enhanced bioavailability, adding different APIs to, to the cannabis oil as an example. There's a lot of interesting things going on on the synthetic side of things. So I guess sophistication downstream is also something that we are going to be seeing. Do you think that's going to be developing more medical looking type products, i.e. things that we commonly think of when we think of medicines? Because I think flower is quite a difficult concept as a medicine, and not least because of the issue that you highlighted before, consistency, you know, patients being able to have like a predictable you know, dose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard to dose on, on inhalation and tea. And that is also the advantage of the extracts. But I guess, yes, I mean... The common thing about medicine and, and what, what is really the, the essence of, of pharmaceuticals and, and biotech is that there is a long pipeline and a very expensive pipeline that ends up with a clinical tested product that then allows the, the company to have a patent. And they're economically incentivized by actually allocating all that resources into R&D to build up that pipeline. Whereas to my understanding, there is not any of these types of pipelines set up for medical cannabis that are that far in the process that you can start to see it as a project that will generate true clinical trial data for treatments. We have products like Sativex, but that's a whole nother subject of cannabis and not this full spectrum product that we are discussing here today. Yeah. And I guess a crucial part of that as well is with the data, you're able to then make medical claims, right? Bit which you can't really do at the moment. There isn't the data to sort of substantiate no, those exactly. claims. No, you, exactly. You can't actually make medical claims. You can only have... There is, of course, studies existing out there. And there is a lot of valuable resources that's being produced all the time. And that enhances the understanding of the product and medical cannabis in general. Patient efficacy, everything. But it's not that clear 100% evidence-based where you can actually claim something for that specific product. We have not seen that yet. And I'm uncertain when it will happen because the endocannabinoid system, the many, the entourage effect, all of that it will be further into the future before that's actually been mapped out. A hundred percent. You know, as we kind of come towards the end, do you see in what you're doing the impact of the disconnect between, I mean, ultimately to really unlock this, it needs doctors buy-in, right? And the fact that there isn't this evidence and data base of, of evidence, or at least not in the form that many widespread kind of 
acceptance is happening because of. Are you seeing that as a key blocker? It is definitely a key blocker. And I think even though cannabis gets widely recognized, there will still be doctors that do not prefer to prescribe it, simply for that reason. However, I also believe that as there become more products available on the market, as the patients have that access to consistent supply of high quality products, the patient base will grow, the knowledge will grow, and it, it will be more widely recognized. And even when we can, can introduce new delivery methods, even just a capsule as an example, that may open up a whole new category of medical cannabis patients that are now no, so not necessarily so afraid of dropping oil into their mouth or inhaling from a flower or, or whatever that those other de delivery methods are. So I believe as the scope and the product variation and the patient-based growth, it will be more commonly recognized, but there will always be reluctance. Yeah, I tend to agree. And I think, you know, it's not only just a battle to convince people of efficacy, but it's, of doctors rather, it's also the battle to convince them that it's not harmful, which they've been, most doctors have grown up with that association. You know, the stigma, yeah. the psychosis and, and all these things that they're worried about. I think, as you say, the more it's kind of used and accepted and realized that the safety profile is actually very good, that might help to loosen people up and be open to it. Yeah, I truly believe it is. And also when we have that knowledge and, and it is more widely commonly accepted, if you look at medical cannabis with a certain type of, of patient as a alternative to opioids, synthetic opioids as an example, then you can vary the side effects and consequence of those two products against each other. And I believe that there's not many who would claim that the synthetic opioids is a winner on the long-term side effect in that regard. Absolutely not. But yet is validated by all competent authorities and is, <laughs> and is gladly handed out by, by many doctors. And it has a very well-documented safety profile. But, you know, that's a totally... <laughs> we could do another episode <laughs> That's also that. another conversation. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for joining me. It's been really, really interesting. We could definitely have talked more. So I look forward to getting you back on the show at some point. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.